You know, but you still got to stay safe. What's going on? There he is. Benny, what's up, my man? How you doing? What's up, Adam? How you doing, brother? Good. How you doing? A little bit underdressed, man. Like, you know, uh, I just got to, I got my shirt. I, I should have known to come more dressed when I'm coming with a fashion designer, you know? Like, I should have stepped my game up a little bit. <laughs> you, you look great always, my man. Thank you so much for having me on today, brother. Yeah, man. No, no worries. No worries. Uh, people are coming in. What's going on, everybody? We just want to say hi to everybody coming through. So many people coming in. I love it. I love it. Um, so everybody, I just want to welcome everybody to Let's Talk with Coach Stone. Hey, Britt. <laughs> there she said, looking good, boys. I love it. Um, so everybody, I just want to let you guys know a little bit. Like um, probably about two months ago, I started going live on Facebook, and then I switched over to Instagram. And it was just a way for me to kind of connect with people, uh, to kind of help people get through this difficult time. And then what I decided was, I have a lot of amazing conversations with some really good friends. And we talk about everything, you know? We talk about business, we talk about relationships, we talk about so many different things. And I decided to start having my friends come on. And, you know, for the last couple of weeks, I had some of my amazing friends come on and share just things that we're talking about, things we're learning and stuff like that. And today I have a very special guest. I have Adam Archer, who's the founder um, of um, Archer the Fourth Luxury Clothing for men and I think women coming soon. And he can tell you all about that. But Adam and I, you know, have became good friends over the last year and a half or, or two. And he's somebody that, you know, I like to have these conversations with because uh, the thing I like about you, Adam, is, you know, you're, you're the type of person to always be honest with where you are in life, and, and I like that. So I wanted to bring you on here to have this conversation, and we can talk about all kinds of things. But first, I want you to tell everybody about, you know, Archer the Fourth and whatever you want to tell them about it. Go ahead and start. Sure, yeah. So Archer the Fourth is a luxury menswear brand. Uh, we proudly manufacture everything right here in Toronto. Um, kind of the ethics of the brand is thinking about um, sustainability and, uh, you know, human rights, because there's a lot of issues in fashion um, on both of those subjects. So, um, you know, we really like just to kind of focus on that and, uh, you know, just let everything else kind of decide itself through that um, ethos. I love that. And, and like, we, how did you kind of get into fashion? Like, how did you even get into this thing, man? <laughs> oh, man. It's kind of a long, weird, funny story. But um, in short, you know, when I was younger, I was very passionate about snowboarding. Um, and then it kind of, you know, I was following that um, path for a while. And, you know, after a while, I had to think about, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Like, my knees aren't going to hold up. <laughs> And, you know, I thought I'd really like to design snowboards. Um, so through that, I, I studied industrial design, um, quickly found out, like, I don't have the technology and stuff to design a snowboard, but I had access to um, soft product design class. Um, so I said, hey, you know what, the next best thing, um, you know, outerwear for snowboarding. And, you know, I became very passionate about that and how technical it was and how much thought went into the design process of that um, through industrial design. Um, at the time I was out in Vancouver and after a while I really started to miss my family who's uh, here uh, in Ontario and Muskoka. And um, when I moved back, I got a couple of new mentors who you know, looked at the outerwear, they were in fashion and they looked at the outerwear that I designed and they said like, yo, you're, you're a fashion designer. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. Um, and they basically talked me into it because I had designed outerwear with more of the intent, like I'm designing technical and snowboarding, not I'm a fashion designer. Um, but, you know, through that, I think brought out some really good designs and a, a good design process that I still follow. And they said, no, like they talked me into it. So um, blessing and a curse to for meeting them, you know. <laughs> totally grateful they're still my mentors today um and you know from from there i started a brand and you know it's kind of taken its twist and turns and developed into where it was today or where it is today i should say sorry yeah yeah you know i like the fact that like you started off 
you know, building snowboards and getting in the snowboard world. And then you looked into outer clothing. And then it was finding mentors that said, hey, you're a clothing designer. Like, yeah. what was it, you know, that those mentors told you that really talked you into, like, designing luxury brand clothes? Like, what, what happened with the mentors that just, they talked you into it? What was it? What, what, what did you take from the conversations? Well, to be honest, it didn't go exactly like that. But, um, you know, I had some technology that I had designed in my outerwear that we originally um, tried to patent um, worldwide. And it didn't, it didn't fully work out because there was a similar patent in Berlin. Um, okay. And it kind of came to a point where it's like to find out if our patent is going to go through, we're going to have to spend, you know, 10, 20 grand just to find out. And it yeah. could be yes or no. Um, right. And both of their background was um, fashion. And, you know, that was kind of when they said to me, like, look, you know, this is and end of the day, this is going to be your money. You can either put 10, 20 grand down and find out, yes, we can have a patent or no, we can't. Um, and, uh, or you can start a fashion label with that money. We think you should do that because we have resources in fashion, uh, blah, blah, blah. But you know, they didn't, they didn't tell me to start a luxury menswear brand made in, in Canada. You know, that was, <laughs> they're pretty much opposite of what they told me. <laughs> right? um, they told me, you know, create uh, women's wear because women, you know, are impulsive buyers when it comes to fashion. Right. Um, do it on the lower end spectrum of price point because then everybody can make it. Think you got, oh, you got caught up for a second. Keep going. Yeah. So yeah, essentially, you know, it's kind of opposite of what my mentors um, told me to do. But um, how I landed on luxury menswear was just through my ethics of looking at, um, you know, the fashion industry as like a, as an opportunity um, because there is so much going on in the industry that is, in my opinion, you know wrong or harming people, it's harming all of us, it's harming the planet. So for me, with my industrial design background, where you think about problem spaces, um, I looked at that as like the biggest opportunity. Um, and in that opportunity, I saw, you know, we have to be considering the planet. Um, so that's going to be a lot on the materials and the production end. Um, and we have to be considering um, people affected, which is, you know, people making it, um, people, you know, selling it, people wearing it, and the impact it's going to have on the planet um, and the people together when it goes back into the earth, you know, and it blends into our water systems in a, in a good or bad way. Um, so through that, you know, I, I basically was put in a point where I had to decide how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not it's not the only process to accomplish those things of, making clothes, considering um, the planet and the people. But my uh, methodology that I've come up with is, okay, if we make it locally, you know, we have proper um, rules and regulations here on how to, you know, just labor laws, right? Yeah. Where other countries who are making garments don't. Um, so, you know, number one, the people are going to be safe who are making it. Um, and then two, um, how are we going to think about the environment? Um, you know, many of the many of the impacts on the environment come from um, you know standards that aren't the manufacturing process. So again, by making it in Canada, you know, it's it's assuring that you know safe dyes are being used, safe processes. Um, so we're kind of covering that. Um, and, and transportation as well, too. I would think you know you're not getting materials from. China and India to primarily sell in, in North America or Europe. So the transportation is probably a big one for, for clothing as well, right? Absolutely. You know, my, my tailor, where I do all my sample making and everything, you know, he's about a 10 minute walk from me. Wow. You know, my, my pattern maker, you know, is about a 10 minute Uber ride, you right. know? So uh, my manufacturers, they're all within the GTA. So nothing we do is too far out. Um, and yeah, so that's basically how I landed doing luxury because, you know, to follow that, it's going to put me at a certain price point, right? 
I think you got hung up there again. Okay, I got you. Yeah, so that's kind of how I landed, you know, where I am today. Yeah, you know, I think that's great. And, um, you know, getting into to men's kind of luxury fashion, I'm sure, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't easy. Um, so, like, what was the thing that just made you, you said you saw an opportunity, but what was it that made you jump into men's sort of fashion when your mentors were saying go with women? Like, you know, and especially at the price point and all that stuff that you're talking about. What, why did you just decide, like, you saw an opportunity, but why did you decide to act on that? Yeah. Um, to be honest, it was, you know, when I first started, I did, I did give it a go with women's wear at a lower price point for a little bit. Um, but for me as a male, I just simply found it um, unrelatable. You know, I was constantly asking um, my partner, Brett, you know, would you wear this? You know, what do you think women, you know, would wear? And I just, I wasn't as confident behind my designs as I wanted to be. Um, but I was falling in love with the process of, you know, clothing and, and, you know, that industry and designing it, um, which just naturally, you know, I'm a very easily inspired person, um, was giving me a lot of inspirations, ideas and um, for menswear. So I just said, you know what, like, I've, I'm struggling to come up with like three concepts for women because I just, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a slow process. But in that process, I was getting a million and one ideas uh, for menswear because I knew I could wear it. I'd like it. So, you know, I just, it just kind of seemed to make more sense to me. Yeah. And I, that's great. And I think, you know, there's, there's something that we have to know as people is sometimes when you, when you feel like you're being pulled towards something, you got to answer the call because, you know, um, sometimes we, we, we set down a path and we, we have in mind what we expect to get and it doesn't turn out the way we want or maybe other opportunities come up and we just completely ignore them. But, you know, you answered the call. You were like, you knew that you were being pulled more towards men's fashion and you just decided to go that way. And um, I think that's important for people to understand because sometimes when you have a goal or you set out to do something and, you, you know, people are afraid to pivot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, in terms of pivoting now with what's going on with COVID and all that, how have you kind of pivoted with the business? What are some of the things that, you've been doing with, with the business? Yeah, um, you know, I think I, I was one of the lucky ones with our with our business where, you know, COVID, um, you know, was really more of like a confirmation that we're going in the right direction, um, which, which was, you know, great. Obviously a very sad time, you know, people are, um, you know, losing uh, loved ones and, and all that. But for us, you know, we were, um, already thinking about sustainability, you know, we already had a message that was like, hey, let's care more about the planet, let's care more about the animals on it, let's care more about the people on it and our health. So, you know, COVID really just kind of confirmed that for us, um, you know, in a, in a broad spectrum and, you know, in a more literal spectrum, um, you know, it's funny, some people are like, did you, did you know this was coming? How do you know? <laughs> did you and I'm like, no, no, not, you know, because um, literally like a month before COVID happened, um, we were designing and prototyping um, surgical masks, right? Oh, which that's was, awesome. Which was up. Yeah. Before this happened, because, and that was just kind of a fluke, but, um, you know, before we were making some more like couture masks. Um, that I was like hand stitching myself and we were selling them from like 800 to a thousand dollars. And we just made them for photo shoots and for the, for the beauty of it. Um, and, you know, uh, everybody wanted to buy them because they're gorgeous and you know, they wanted to wear them for, you know, photos or whatever. Um, so we, at that time we just said like, Hey, let's make a mask that's more affordable, still looks beautiful. You know, we'll make it out of silk but everybody can wear it, right? Yeah. Um, so we started creating that and then COVID hit and everyone's like, how'd you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, listen, like one thing, whoever's, whoever's watching this right now, you guys gotta check out Adam's, Adam's um, clothes, man. I mean, your clothes are amazing, man. They're amazing, the materials, the quality. I mean, it, it's just, you can tell the detail. You can tell that it's more than just clothes to you. I can tell just from, you know, um, trying on the clothes, seeing the clothes, I can tell it's more than just, I'm just putting something together. So 
for anybody who's watching, you definitely have to go check out Archer the Fourth. Uh, Adam, we have a question here from um, Brandon Bug. He said, uh, "Who are your current inspirations right now for the brand?" Mm. Um, as far as like people, um, you know, designers that inspire me. It's uh, you know, it's always been Alexander McQueen and Tom Ford. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. those were my constant main twos. Yeah. You know, I kind of like to think of myself like kind of blending, um, taking from both of them to make, you know, it's like two of them made a baby and it's me kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what, what do you take from each one of them? What's the thing yeah. or one or two things that you take from each one of them? Yeah, so um, Alexander McQueen, um, you know, I really love how um, kind of like dark and romantic um, his designs are, right? Like. He'll go all the way left um, just for the art of it, just to create some pure beauty, um, you know, that will make people feel something, right. you know, uh, like art, you know. And um, I think, you know, my brand, for example, has a beautiful message about, um, you know, the planet and not harming humans. But if it's boring, then that's not really going to come through, right? right? So my goal is always to create things where people are like, oh, like, you know, why'd you make that or whatever and get people, get people talking um, cause, and then have that pull them in to that message through, you know, beautiful visuals and designs. Um, so I love that about McQueen. You know, he's no longer with us, rest in peace, but um, his, his legacy will be uh, left on forever. Yeah. Um, Tom Ford, on the other hand, you know, he creates really beautiful garments too that are also, you know, very luxurious and you know kind of seductive and romantic um but he's really really good at creating something that's so beautiful uh you know that looks like nothing else but that everybody can wear you yeah. know that you can put it in a store sell it to almost anybody you know everybody will wear that velvet blazer in a different way dress it up dress it down for different occasions um and obviously you know in in fashion or in art um, we can't make things, um, you know, they get attention that people talk about, you know, because then I'd, you know, I'd go bankrupt and, you know, <laughs> make, make more clothes. So, you know, I come forward as like a, um, you know, his ideology of how he sells things and still makes things beautiful. Yeah. I think it's like the simple, like simple beauty, right? Like when I look at your stuff, I, it looks like art. It looks like. You know, it, it has, you can see the creativity and the simplicity and the art all together. I mean, would you, is that accurate? Is that what you're trying to go for? Yeah, absolutely. And thank, thank you so much for those kind words. Um, you know, absolutely. I'm, I'm really trying to, um, you know, make it like art. I mean, if, if money wasn't a thing, I would probably just go all the way left to like McQueen and just make art. But, um, you know, I, I do try to try to make things, you know, that everybody can wear and, and buy um, so that we can create, you know, sustainability in the, in the brand so it lasts. Um, and then my, you know, my real goal is just to make a uh, greater impact. And, you know, if I'm only around for a couple of collections or a couple of seasons, you know, I'm not going to make that impact that I, I'm really trying to do um, because, you know, the, the problems that we're having in the fashion industry is something that's affecting, you know, the entire planet and everybody on it. You know, we all wear clothes, um, you know, fashion industry is the world's second largest industrial polluter. So right. you know, I feel like we have a lot of work to do, um, you know, so yeah, I'm really hoping to tie people in um, through the art of the, the brand and the creative direction um, so that they fall in love with you know, the idea of what, um, you know, what that represents. No, I love it. I love it. it. Because if it doesn't start with you or it doesn't start with a few people, when will, how will it get better? And I love the fact that you decided that you were going to take this on. And even though you have a luxury clothing brand, you still care about the planet. You still care about the materials. You still care about the people that are processing these clothes and making these clothes and manufacturers who are being you know, paid nothing, you know? So I love the fact that you're um, turning the light inward on the fashion industry because it has to start somewhere. So, man, I respect you for, for that. And I respect you for what your brand is about as well, brother. Thank, thank you so much, Danny. 
And, uh, you know, it, it's a great point. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a point where, you know, I like to question and I want people, other people to question, like, what does it mean to be, you know, luxury, right? Should, shouldn't a luxury, like, fashion brand, you know, uh, give people, you know, health and, you know, create health, you know, healthy conditions, um, you know, on our planet, create healthy work conditions for the people who are making it, you know, it shouldn't just be me that's benefiting, you know what I mean? Like, I could have, t I could have made, you know, the same silhouettes out of similar fabrics, you know, in a different place in the world, and made a lot more margin. And, you know, even by bringing my price down, but, you know, there's going to be people suffering in that. And, you know, no, nobody would have to know, you know, a lot of brands, right do a great job on kind of not showing that and just giving you this image that, you know, this is luxury. Um, but to me that, that I wouldn't feel right. And that's not luxury if other people are suffering so that I, you know, benefit more, you know, Bro, or, I love it. I love it. So who, who have been some of your biggest clients and what, what is the most expensive thing that you've sold? Oh God. Um, uh, you know, we've, I've been pretty lucky. I got really lucky, you know, especially like, uh, beginning of uh, of March the fourth to dress um, some really awesome people just out of organic interest. Um, you know, we put clothes on a couple of the maple leaves. Um, you know, a uh, couple of NFL players. Um, you know, a couple uh, music directors, a uh, couple movie directors. So some 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 pretty big names, and you know almost all of them was through organic interest, um, whether it was like the other that we were in or, you know, another connect. Um, so it's been pretty, pretty awesome that way. Um, and, you know, the, as far as like the highest price, um, you know, there's been people that, you know, just want like something super exclusive. Um, and the thing is, is like when you, and the people that really, it's the people that really care about the process um, you know, because there's a million different types of cashmere out there, you know, um, but the people that come to me and they're like, I want the softest cashmere that you can get. And I'm like, listen, you know, that comes with the price. And I'm like, <laughs> right. you know, you can get a, a cashmere for like, say, $80 um, a yard, you know, to give you an idea. Um, and then there's cashmere that we used um, from Mongolia, which is, you know, the perfect climate in the world. Um, for the cashmere because the elevation and humidity and then they only take it from the goats under carriage one time right so oh. think of like baby hairs right they're so soft and then weather and everything kind of you know makes them more coarse as time go on so you know that cashmere is eight hundred dollars a yard <laughs> because of because of the process right so right. It's, it's really, you know, in the, in the materials um, on custom pieces, you know, we can, we can happily create um, anything that you want, um, no matter how luxurious it is, so. That's dope, man, I love it. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about like some of the challenges that you've had to, or, you know, what's like a big challenge you've had to overcome in your business? Mm, um, I'd say the biggest one is just, you know, sticking true to, um, you know, our brand's kind of ethics, you know, made in Canada. Yeah. That, you know, there isn't, a, there isn't a lot of manufacturers in Canada and there's only a handful of good, right? And uh, so it's, it's hard, you know, um, when you want to make, you know, not just t-shirts, I want to make, you know, a hand-stitched suit, um, you know, to find the people that will do that um, because it's limited and as well it's it's hard to deal with them because they know that they're the only ones right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know they're kind of like they have a little bit of power there um and really that's taken me you know three or four years to fine tune to where you know now i have people manufacturers that i get along with really well you know that respect me we have mutual respect um you know so there's that and then there's you know, the financial um, aspect, you know, because like I said, you know, manufacturing in Canada um, with natural materials like like silk, cashmere, all that, that comes at a certain price point, you know, it's like, 
you know, coming into the big leagues right away. Um, but, you know, sticking with those ethics is so important to the brand that we've struggled and, and scraped and, and pivoted and, you know, persevered all the way through. So, you know, uh, I'm thankful that I've, I've made it this far because I feel like, you know, knock on wood, I've made it through the, the hardest parts and, uh, you know, no looking back now. No, you know, and I know, I think this is something that people need to understand because, you know, I've been an entrepreneur full time for about eight years. And, you know, one of the things that I often tell people is like, your what and your why have to be so big, right, that you can't get derailed by the how. So you know what your vision is. This is your vision for your, your and the, the reason why that you started the company and the reason why you're so concerned about the planet and, you know, trying to um, get quality products and making sure that the manufacturing is coming from specific places. Like you have all of this what in the why. And I think it's important because even when we struggle sometimes, like I've struggled in my business, but nothing can stop me, right? Like I'm, I'm not going to quit just because I have a down couple of months or even a down year. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue to help people turn their passion into profit and make a greater impact because my what and my why are so big. And that's what it kind of seemed like for you. Like, even in the struggles of things not going right, you just have a bigger mission. Would you say that that's true? Like, is that the thing that kind of keeps you going? Yeah, I, absolutely. You know, I, the way that I look at it, like, personally is, you know, how am I going to feel when I, when I die? You know, um, I think about that a lot, not in a morbid way, but in, in, a, in a positive way where, you know, one day it's going to happen. And you know, I could do this a few different ways. I could, you know, manufacture somewhere overseas. You know, my life would probably be a lot easier right now. I'm not saying that that process is, is plain and simple too, but, um, you know, I just think about, you know, what, how do I want to feel when I go? What impact do I want to make? And at the end of the day, if I'm not thinking about, um, you know, the impact of the garments that I'm making, are having on the planet or the people, you know, I just know too much at this point that I would be part of, you know, such a huge problem. I'd be part of, um, you know, the world's second biggest uh, industrial polluter. I'd be yeah. adding that. Great. Yeah. I mean, a million garments and they were made out of plastic. And now I'm part of the, you know, that those plastic pieces ended up, you know, tiny little pieces in the ocean, you know, we, we drank that, you know, t-shirt I made 10 years ago in our water because that's what right. happened. Um, and, you know, if I was manufacturing somewhere else and it didn't have proper labor laws, it'd be like, you know, I'd die and be like, cool, I made a million garments. I employed a million people that were, um, you know, being paid unfair working wages, living in a basement somewhere with their whole family, working 12-hour days, you know, like, um, it's just too real. So for me, I just think about when I go, you know, what's, what's going to matter in the end. Um, it's not going to be money, you know, I mean, money, money's great and everything. And I love money, but, um, you know, when, when we, when we die at the end of our life, I think the only things that are really going to matter is how we treated, you know, people, including ourselves, our family, our friends, uh, strangers, you know, people that work with us, people that work for us, and the planet, the environment, you know, ev you know, the water, the air, the trees, everything that we're relying on to live, right? At the end of the day, you know, if say we go back into the universe or whatever happens, we don't know. Um, I think those are the only things that we know is actually real, right? Because right. like, you know, money and, you know, governments and that's something man made that's something we made up so i don't think it's fair to say that we're going to take that with us or that's going to matter anymore. you know what adam i think that's a great point because a lot of us don't think about legacy we don't think about contribution until you know usually something traumatic happens in our life or we're at the end of our lives and what we have to understand is that every day you wake up you can make a decision to to continue to build your legacy right you're one person who started a brand to help save the environment and all, and 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 to reduce pollutions and all that kind of stuff like but you're one person who just decided that you're going to do it and i think for a lot of people they look at they might look at you or they might look at somebody standing on a stage and say i can't make that impact i can't do that that's not me 
Like, what would you tell somebody about, you know, creating their legacy where they are right now? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think um, I, I would tell them, I would tell anybody, I tell, uh, you know, people um, who I speak to all the time that, like, we, ca we can make an impact. You know what I mean? We, we have choices. Uh, we have to be conscious and aware of, you know, what we're doing and realize that that is impacting, you know, how I, how I move today impacts, you know, everybody that I come in contact with, you know, right. you, everybody that's watching this, boom, now maybe I'm just some guy that, you know, has a, has a dream and has a vision. Um, but you know what, if I put out some simple information right now, like, hey, guys, when you buy garments, you know, um, you don't have to buy Archer the Fourth, maybe it's not your style, maybe it's out of your price point, maybe whatever, you know, that's okay. But what we can all do is we can flip our, our garments inside out right here and look at the tag in the garment. And like, look, if you're buying something that's 100% natural material, like cotton, um, you know, bamboo, whatever, as opposed to um, lycra, nylon, you know, which are the same properties as plastic, um, you're going to make a huge impact because how many garments are you going to wear in your life? Um, and where do those go? Well, you know, they might go to a secondhand store, a vintage store, and might pass them down. Hopefully they last for a hundred years or longer, whatever. But at the end of the day, they're going to end up um, in a landfill um, or somewhere like that. Um, it's going to break down into little tiny pieces, right? And if it's natural materials, it's going to turn to dust and go back into the ecosystem, the whole um, you know, environment that was already mapped out and runs perfectly without us on here. As soon as we add in something like plastic, like polyester or something like that, um, you know, you're creating a negative impact. So just by doing one little thing, like looking at um, the tags on our garments, it's just stopping to think about that. And, you know, often we don't have that information. You know, I didn't always have this information. I had to learn it from somebody. Um, and now, you know, maybe one of the people that are watching us live right now will do that. Maybe they'll, they'll share that with somebody else. And boom, that's, you know, if that's the only impact I, I make, then that's okay, you know? I love like, it. I love that, Adam. I love it. And, and yes, I, I completely agree. Even if you just learn to read the label on your clothes, I mean, that's a big deal, right? So I love the fact that you just said that because... That just shows that one simple thing, that's one simple thing that all of us can do uh, is just be more conscious and aware of where our clothes are coming from or what they're made of. So I really love that. Um, we got some comments here. Anthony uh, Sorella says, Adam is one of the hardest working and most humble dudes I've ever met. Shout out to Adam and the whole team at Arch of the Ford. Uh, Britt, I think you might know Britt. <laughs> uh, she said, Adam has taught uh, taught me that resilience is the key to achieving your dreams. Way to go, babe. Uh, Carol, you. Carol Archer here. We are proud of you and uh, your whole family. Oh, you got a family? Man, this guy's a, he's a celebrity. He has everybody in here. Uh, the Wilder Wellness. Uh, love, love to um, Archer the Fourth family and everyone supporting the brand and the mission. Uh, Jill here says COVID is creating the desire for for Canadian made products. Yeah. That's a really that's really interesting. Absolutely. Have you guys yeah. seen any of that? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. You know, like I said at the beginning, like this, um, this COVID is as sad as it is, um, you know, and, you know, our prayers to anybody who's lost somebody um, through this, but, um, you know, it's been a positive in that sense for you know, not just myself and my brand, but, you know, other brands too, where people are thinking more about um, where and how their products are made, you know, the impact that that's going to have on the, on the planet, um, the people, you know, I mean, look at one little, one little incident. I mean, we won't get too far into it, but, you know, we've all, all heard different, um, you know, uh, theories or whatever on how COVID started, right? Um, and regardless to what that was, that was that was one one event, right? One of one little event, and you know, boom, it affected the whole world so quickly, right? Um, so people are really starting to to I think kind of be more aware 
of, you know, the impact that little things have, whether it's what clothes we're wearing, um, you know, what food we're eating, um, you know, and realizing that, hey, we're all connected to each other and this planet. Um, we all need each other to, to live. We all need each, uh, we need the planet to be healthy um, so that we can continue to live. And, you know, that's really kind of been all under, you know, the brand's ethos, um, you know, and kind of supports what, we, what we've been talking about um, for a while, so. I love it, I love it. And, you know, just kind of moving away from that, like, what is it like, right? So you're a business owner now. Is your, is your partner a business owner as well? Um, yeah, so my partner, Britt, um, you know, she's, she's in the health and wellness, um, you know, field. So, you know, we kind of inspire each other um, you know, in that way, you know, she's not in fashion. She used to be in fashion. Um, she sp inspired me uh, a lot in fashion in previous years, you know, introduced me to a lot of the big designers and stuff that, you know, I didn't even know about before. So shout out to her. Um, I love that. I love it. Yeah, um, go ahead. She, she's, she's doing her part uh, in health and wellness and, and, you know, really looking at, uh, you know, how we can use, you know, natural ingredients and, you know, natural remedies to, to heal ourselves. So yeah, kind of in the similar spirit of, of what I'm doing, just to, in a different um, field. So, so talk to people about, because, you know, my wife is an entrepreneur as well. Trudy's in the health and wellness space. She's yeah. a TV expert, all that stuff. And so how, how, talk a little bit about both of you guys working, being entrepreneurs and kind of what that dynamic is like, because I think sometimes people, uh, I think it's important for people to understand what the dynamic is like when you're both entrepreneurs and you're both sort of working as entrepreneurs. Talk a little bit about that dynamic and what that kind of looks like for you guys. Yeah, well, I'm sure you can relate, you know, like it's uh, it's got, you know, both sides to it, positives and, and negative, or not negatives, but hard times we'll call it because, you know, when you're both on a, uh, you know, an un uncharted journey, um, you know, it can cause a lot of, you know, stress and tension under one household, right? I'm sure you can relate. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I wouldn't have it any other way because, um, you know, we both have somebody who understands um, what it's like to make, to take, you know, a little more of an unconventional route, um, you know, and we're able to support each other, uh, you know, emotionally probably better than, you know, if we were with somebody else that was, you know, doing a more conventional path. So, um you know, and then, you know, we get to inspire each other and say, hey, did you think about this? Or like, hey, I'm doing this in my business. And like, yeah, it's different. But like, you know, maybe you consider that down the road. Um, and then, you know, anytime one of us has has a win, right? It's super inspiring. It's like, oh, you did that. That's so amazing. I can, I can do that too, right? And I think all entrepreneurs, I'm sure you would agree, Danny, we need that energy we need those people around us who who understand um you know what we're what we're doing and how hard it is or you know how how uh you know understand the long vision of like how great it's gonna be you know when we have more achievements and more wins right yeah i think that i think as an entrepreneur a lot of people have to understand being an entrepreneur is not easy you know, a lot of people sometimes make it make it seem like, oh, I'm just going to go and start a business and everything, sales are going to roll in and people are going to love me and my client. It doesn't work like that. You have to put a lot of time and effort and you have to be willing to weather the storm. And, you know, when I first became an entrepreneur, my wife wasn't. She was working in the corporate world. So what happened was I was working in the corporate world as well. And then I had a side hustle. So I was putting in like 16, 18 hour days. And she was like, why are you doing this? This is ridiculous. She, she didn't understand, right? But she saw how dedicated I was to helping people really change their life. And then I, I would get a win and she would be like, okay. Or I, somebody would leave a testimonial and, I, and I, a heartfelt thing. And she was like, wow, you're really out here making a difference. And she'll tell you to this day, that's what really inspired her to follow her dreams and her passion. So I completely agree. Like when both people are entrepreneurs, you can support each other creatively, you know, um, mentally in tough times, but also sharing those successes as well. So I love that, man. I love to hear that about you too. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so Sig Siggy Lee said, 
I read my labels all the time because of you now. Uh, CP2 Brand said, Danny, love these, uh, love these live events. They're great. Uh, Julia Archer said, we love you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and CP2 Brand said, it's, it's hard work. Nothing in life is easy. I think that's a good mess. I think that's a good message too, because, um, you know, I'm sure you had some challenges. Talk a little bit about like, like partnerships or working with people when it didn't work out. Cause I think this is important for people to understand. Oh man. Yeah. It's been, um, you know, it, there's definitely been some partnerships that didn't work out. Um, and you know, those are, those have been some of the hardest moments, you know, um, uh, but, uh, you know, through those most difficult moments, that's when you learn the most, right? And you kind of learn to like pivot and oh, what I took from this relationship, you know, it's just gonna make me better um, for the next one. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a wild journey. Uh, you know, it's a wild <laughs> journey. You know, it's tough. I've had lots of, I shouldn't say a lot, but my fair share of partnerships or business relationships that didn't work out. Yeah. And you really have to just learn from it and grow. And it should make you smarter, right? You should be more selective moving forward about the partnerships that you choose to form. And I think that's really important. Talk a little bit about, like, um, do you have, like, a morning ritual or morning routine? Like, because I think what happens is, you know, really successful people start their day a certain way. Are you, are you that way? Do you have, like, a routine or a ritual that you, the way you start your morning? Yeah. I, to be honest with you, Danny, I try. I try so hard. Uh, I'd say I'm more of a night person than a morning person. Okay. So, uh, but I, I, do, I do really try to implement a morning routine. And the days that I stick to it, my day is just so much better, right? Um, my day always starts out with um, coffee, although I try to drink a glass of water before I have a coffee. Yeah. And even that small thing um, makes a big difference. Um, the days when I really nail my morning ritual, I have coffee, I have a small breakfast, um, I'll do a small workout, um, just to get things flowing. Um, I'll do uh, meditation. I really like um, the Wim Hof uh, meditation method, okay. uh, which is amazing. I don't know if you've, if you've heard of that. Explain that now. Let, let us know what that is. Um, so it's a, it's a really good theory. I, I think everybody should check it out. But Basically, it's based on um, two things. Uh, one is a breathing technique, um, and one is uh, using the colds, like a cold shower, um, to kind of awaken our systems um, so that we're running our best. Um, and in short, it, it essentially says, you know, in our busy lives that we have today, um, especially for entrepreneurs, right? We, you know, a lot of our days filled with stress, um, and you know, it, things are too busy. So we're holding our, we're holding our breath. You know, I know I do this. I take short breaths all day. Like yeah. it's, you know, my energy has to go somewhere else rather than breathing. Right. Um, and I take short breaths, you know, especially when things get tense. So it's the breathing part. It just makes you breathe in really deep, uh, in and out 10, uh, 30 times and then pause. And you can hold your breath for like way longer than you did. Um, and then you do that again. You breathe in 30 times, pause. You can hold your breath for like up to a minute and a half. And you do that cycle three times. And what happens is your body gets uh, more oxygen, you know, the proper amount of oxygen, you know, for many people, you get the, the proper amount of oxygen for the first time in like months or years, yeah. maybe your whole life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it basically like wakes your body up and, and lets it run how, you know, it was supposed to run, um, you know. And then the second part is you hop in a cold shower. So I do that um, usually on my bed down after breakfast. Um, and in that, you know, you're only supposed to focus on your breath. So often, you know, your brain relaxes and kind of wakes up at the same time. Um, and often I solve some of my biggest problems in that in that. In that moment it's weird you know at the no, end of the, I love like, it. Oh, you know that one problem i had that i've been trying to figure out for weeks you know that i've seemed like the biggest deal i'll just do this and it'll work out uh so i love that everybody you heard it first adam is now a meditation and breathing expert <laughs> but you know I, I think that's 
you know, I, I tell everybody, every coaching client I ever have has to have a morning ritual. Yeah. They have to have it because a lot of the things that you just talked about, I talk about meaning, meditation, mantra, movement. If you don't have it, you're giving your, you're starting your day giving it to, to problems and giving it to everybody else but, but yourself. Yeah. And I think that's really important that we start our days putting ourselves first. And like you said, I've solved some of my biggest problems uh, exercising or, or meditating, like things I've been struggling with for the longest time. So yeah. there's definitely power in having a really strong morning ritual um, because it helps me solve all kinds of problems. It also reduces your stress. It helps you um, create more clarity. You get more focused on the things that are important. Uh, I don't know if all that stuff happens for you, but with my morning ritual and most of my clients, like their stress level is just like this. So when they're at work or they're in their, in their, in their business and everybody else is panicking, they're always already in solution mode. And they, a, a lot of us contribute that to the way that we start our day and the way that we end our night. Do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, you know, I think all, all meditation, you know, and those elements of, you know, your morning ritual, whether it's working out and then, you know, meditating, um, whatever, it's so important. Um, in fact, the, the Wim Hof method that I, I was speaking about, um, this guy, I think he's from Amsterdam originally, and now he's like, you know, kind of a sensation. Um, he's blown up. But they, he, um, his theory is that, you know, his method will actually cure um, a lot of mental illness, like depression, anxiety, all of this, um, and even more, which I won't get into because it's kind of medical and clinical, but um, he... He believed in it so much, he hired a team of, of scientists in Amsterdam um, who hooked up all these things to his body and said, you know, try to prove me wrong. And, and they're like, no, you're right. Like, this is actually happening inside your body just through breathing and going into a cold shower. Um, and then recently he did, um, NASA reached out to him and said, hey, you know, do you feel confident enough that, you know, we'll put our scientists here at NASA up to your you know, theory, and I said, absolutely, let's go, um, and they, they, you know, ran all the tests, did all the studies, and they're like, wow, this is like, this is incredible, you're actually healing your body, you're healing your mental illness, you're healing, you know, um, all this stuff just through breathing, and cold, and, you know, the cold, so. But I think that's important, because as entrepreneurs, we're always on the go, we're always doing 10 different things, and the last thing that we take care of is ourselves, so I, I like that. Uh, CP2 brand said, in these times uh, of the biggest things, one of, some of the biggest things that we should be doing is building strategic partnerships. You know, I, I think that's, um, I think that's important too. Like, you know, building strategic partnership. But, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about as well is like, when you're doing something and people see that you have a passion for the thing that you're doing, so many people want to get on board, right? They want to, okay, Adam, let's do this and let's partner up with this. And, you know, I get it all the time. But I think it's really important that, one, it's mutually beneficial. And two, you're not spending time working on someone else's business more than your own. You know, has that ever happened to you? Has it happened to me many times? Too many times, like on, on the regular. It's just an ongoing thing, um, you know, where you're, you know, I mean, every day, you know, people want to, you know, be a part of the brand or whatever. And, and, and that's great. That's super flattering. You know, we, we really appreciate everybody's um, interest and support, um, you know, and, and some people that we've got involved with, you know, it, you know, worked out, some didn't. Um, but like you said, Danny, you know, at the end of the day, it just has to be uh, mutual beneficial. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's like shortcuts, but for, for me and for uh, the brand, we, you know, we kind of had to go through a couple good ones, a couple bad ones to see, you know, what that really looks like. Um, and of course, some great advice from my mentors, but, um, and then further down the line, you start to recognize like, oh, no, I've seen this before. That's, right. that's for me. you know, thank you. Um, or, oh, this is something new, but we're going to proceed, you know, with caution and go into it a little slower than the last time, you know, when you work with somebody or under these terms and conditions or, or whatever, right? I think that's important because sometimes when you get burned by somebody or, you know, sometimes you even have family and friends that don't believe in your dream and your vision and they yeah. try to talk you out of it. 
and it can be discouraging at times. But the fact is you have to learn from that and you have to keep going. And I often tell people progress equals belief. Like nobody believes in your dreams until your dreams start to come true. And then everybody wants to get on board, right? Like when I left the corporate world, people are like, you're leaving this quote unquote good job to do a, start your own business. It's so hard. You're, they were basically telling me all the reasons I was going to fail. Then all of a sudden, you know, they might've seen one of my ads running or they might've seen me, you know, do some promo somewhere on a show or something. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, okay, well, yeah, this thing's working out okay. Or my book comes out or whatever. And I think it's really important that you just stay focused on you, right? Progress yeah. equals belief. You have to focus on you and maybe your loved ones or those partners that kind of are skeptical may eventually come around. But I, I see, like, I see it with you. I see the passion that you have for what you do. And I see like your determination and you don't seem like somebody who's going to stop. And that's what I love about it. And it's contagious because other, I can see why people want to partner up with you because they're like, this dude's amazing. Right. But you also have to be cautious and learn from those things, uh, but also be open to, to new partnerships as well. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. You, you know, that Danny, you know, you really just have to, be so focused uh, on your own goals and believing in yourself that you don't need other people's validation. And, you know, the positive, um, you know, the positive comments you hear um, and the negative ones, you just, you don't even, you don't even recognize them, right? Like it's, um, and you can't, you can't expect everybody to understand, right? right. Uh, because we're all on our unique journey and, you know, my journey probably looks, you know, scary or weird or, or whatever to somebody else. And that's okay, because that's not their journey. So, you know, as long as you keep your, your eye on, you know, what matters to you and, and where you're going and your vision, then, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you agree, you kind of get good at that, right? I love, I love what you said. Your, your, your vision and where you're going, your path is different than other people. You know, we have to stop trying to put ourselves in the box of somebody else. You're unique. Your experiences, how you grew up, the friendships, the ups and downs are different than everyone else. So your journey's not going like, to look like everybody else. I love that. What's up, Vantage Point? Dr. Vibe is in here. Uh, Sean said, another, uh, another, informa another great information session, Danny. Good job. Great guest. I enjoyed this session. Um, we have about six or seven minutes left. What are some other things that you want to talk about? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, we have a, a new website, um, going to be launched soon. Um, you know, in the next, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but it's going to be soon. Um, uh, it's very close. Um, so in that we're, we're launching a new, uh, essentials line, um, you know, more, more e-commerce focused, um, in a, in a price point that everybody should be able to, um, you know, kind of purchase something, um, the focus is, you know, you know, same thing, sustainability, um, and how we're doing that with our essentials line is we're using organic cottons that are harvested in North America. Okay. Um, organic cotton matters because there's no pesticides put on it. Um, so you know, like earlier we we're talking about, I'll uh, just use like um, natural materials, but you know, to take it one step further, you know, cotton is a natural material. Um, but depending on where that cotton is made, um, you know, it still have a pretty big negative impact on people and on the planet because, um, you know, there's so much pesticides and stuff sprayed on it that one that's going into the ground and into the soil, which is eventually goes to the water system. It also goes on the hands and, you know, in the lungs of the farmers who are creating it. Um, and then when we get it and we wear it on our skin, you know, it's not to say that they washed it properly or that those chemicals can fully come out and as we wear and we sweat, um, that can go into us. So we're using um, in our new essentials line coming up 100% uh, organic cotton, yeah. um, which is, you know, harvested, grown, milled, everything in North America. So awesome. it's, very, it's very controlled. Um, we're really excited about that because, you know, it's going to be in a price range that um, everybody, uh, you know, can you know, can afford, you know, if, if desired, um, you know, we're still going to continue to do like our custom pieces. Um, we're just adding this in, um, you know, to, uh, 
so everybody can have a piece. I know? love it, man. I love the fact that you're trying to appeal, uh, allowing people to get a, a luxury product that's, you know, organic and, and, and you know, still in an aff affordable price point. Um, Jill here says, will you make, uh, will you have masks on the website? Yes. Um, so Jill, yeah, we're going to have, we're going to launch um, with three, three different styles of masks, um, you know, all under the same kind of principles made in Toronto, uh, natural materials like silk and velvet. Um, and we're going to have three styles to start. Um, so that would that'd be really exciting. And then, you know, we're going to see how those go. Um, we have some more products to drop um, in the future. Um, starting out, it's going to be three masks. Um, three styles of tees. Uh, we're going to do another drop shortly after with some sweats and stuff out of the organic cotton too. Um, we're going to see how this thing pans out with the whole um, COVID thing. But, you know, like I said, we started out in the beginning doing the mask more for fashion than, you know, this. Um, so we'll probably can always continue for a while anyways to do masks um, for fashion um, and keep that going. Uh, permanent vacation brand says love it quality is always top notch from y'all what's up what's up permanent vacation another great toronto brand um they make really awesome stuff great guys um you know we kind of started around the same time and you know i've got all the respect in the world for that brand and and the people behind it awesome stuff so go check them out too uh, Jill said, definitely need some fashionable ma masks for going back to work. I love it. I love that. Yeah, um, we, we got you. We got you. Website coming really soon. Yeah, man. You know, uh, Adam, it's been a great conversation. I think that you really kind of educated us a lot on sort of the whole clothing industry because, you know, there's a lot of things I know I personally didn't know, so I'm sure um, you, you really left us with some things to think about and some knowledge. And I really hope that a lot of you guys watching really take note of where your clothes are coming from, what they're made of, and so on. So we got about a minute and 50 seconds left. Do you want to – the other thing is make sure you go and follow Archer the Fourth. Make sure you go and follow that clothing brand because their stuff is super dope, all right? So we got about a minute and a half. Anything else you want to say, Adam? Yeah, yeah. Just a uh, shout-out to you, Danny, for having me on. Thank you so much, my brother. I appreciate you. Um, and thank you for all the all the content that you put out. Um, if you guys are you know following Archer the Fourth and you know new to Danny, definitely follow him. He's a very inspiring guy. Um, also, shout out to Danny for this, this <laughs> book. Yeah. You know, he wrote um, very inspiring. If you're on a on a journey like we are, you know there's a lot of stories about people um, who were on you know similar journey and how they persevered through it. Um, so check that out through Danny's channel. Great book. And thanks for everybody, uh, you know, who joined in. And, um, you know, I appreciate you guys. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks for uh, shouting out the book, Adam. And uh, Britt said, loved it. Thanks for the knowledge, guys. Look, uh, I'm back on Friday, everybody, at 2. Uh, I got another great guest coming, a good friend of mine, who's all about uh, real estate and financial investing. So make sure you come back uh, Friday at 2 p.m. Adam, thanks again, man. It was awesome having you on. And we'll thank definitely you, catch up soon, brother. Thank you, my man. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Later. All right.